Hello, welcome to our webinar, everyone. This is Turning Analytics into Customer Engagement. I'm Allison Ryder, Senior Project Editor here at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I will be your moderator today. This event is going to be recorded, and it will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of this live event. Um, and additionally, today's slides will be made available to all attendees. We welcome your questions for our speakers today, and to submit those, please enter them anytime in the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel. You can also submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREvent, and we'll answer as many of your questions as time will permit today. If you're having any audio difficulties while listening on your computer, you could call in via telephone instead, or check the help link in the upper part of your console. Our speakers today are Teddy Bekelli, Vice President of Agriculture Technology for Winfield United, which is a division of Lando Lakes, Inc. Sam Ransbotham, co-author of Using Analytics to Improve Customer Engagement, guest editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and Associate Professor of Information Systems at Boston College's Carroll School of Management, and David Kieran, also a co-author of the Analytics Report and Executive Editor of MIT Sloan Management Review. Our thanks go out to SAS for their sponsorship of this webinar. And now, on to our presentation, Turning Analytics into Customer Engagement. Sam, could you start our discussion? Hi, and welcome everybody. This is Sam's voice. If you lose track of, track of who's speaking, I'm the one with a silky smooth southern accent. Um, thanks. I don't want to spend too much time on preamble, but it would be negligent of, to skip a few important thank yous to everyone who's been involved in the research and the report and the webinar. Uh, first of all, we, we appreciate the support of SAS, our sponsor, and John Ball in particular. Uh, additionally, it takes a number of people at MIT Sloan Management Review to get such a high quality product complete. Deb Gallagher, Lauren Rosano, Allison Ryder, Jenny Martin, and I probably should not have started listing names because I'm sure that I've left someone out and I'm sorry. Um, and our research builds on interviews and survey responses. And so we appreciate everyone who helped with both of these. Uh, both are very important for, their, for our research program. And finally, we appreciate everyone that's read the report and is joining us today for the webinar. Uh, we have a ton of people on the on the webinar today, and it's it's exciting to see. I'd like to think that's because of my uh, my own personal magnetism, but I think it's the topic of analytics and customer engagement that is the topic of widespread interest. Um, so thanks everyone for making the time uh, for making the time to join us today, and we'll try hard to provoke some thought and some discussion. So our general plan for the next hour is to first welcome Teddy Bekele. Uh, I'll mention more about him in a moment, but we're thrilled to have him with us today. Uh, and after Teddy, Ted, David Kieran and I will delve into a few key points from this year's research program, and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so enough preamble. We're thrilled to have Teddy with us today to tell us some of the impressive things that he and his group are working on. Teddy's the Vice President of AG International Technology at Winfield United, which is the seed and crop business of Land of Lakes. At Winfield, he helps develop new technologies to take to the farm. I could tell you more, but it's much more interesting to hear it directly from Teddy. So Teddy, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Teddy Bekele, and what I wanted to do was, first of all, thank the MIT Sloan Management Review for having me on this, uh, on this call. I'm pretty excited to be, uh, to be here to tell our story and, and the journey we've been on. So uh, this, is, this is a great honor for me, and I don't have a smooth, silky, a silky southern voice, but uh, I'll do my best to, uh, uh, to keep it entertaining. So like I said, uh, like Sam said earlier, my name is Teddy Bekele. I'm the Vice President of Ag Technology for Winfield United. And let's see if I can advance the slides here. And um, Winfield United is a, is a division of Land O'Lakes, and um, there's actually three divisions or four divisions within Land O'Lakes. It's the crop inputs business. And uh, in, that, in that division, we're a distributor of seed, crop protection, and plant nutrition products. We also have our Purina division, which is an animal nutrition. So we make formulations for a variety of animals. Um, now we said the name Purina, uh, but there's a dog and cat division that belongs to Nestle. We actually have all the other animals, including uh, uh, cows, chickens, horses, uh, and everything else, uh, including zoo animals. And then the, the, the division that most people know Land O'Lakes for is the butter and cheese, um, which is an iconic brand. And then we also have a fourth division we started uh, just recently last year. And, and that division is called Land O'Lakes Sustain. And the purpose of Sustain is really to look at sustainability efforts within each of these divisions and how we could get better, but also look across the divisions. Because one of the things that Land O'Lakes has as a unique value proposition 
is we have this view in the entire value chain from farm to fork. And what do I mean about that is, you know, we start actually with the crop inputs and we put you know, in inputs into the ground and some of those inputs, those seeds are uh, alpha, alpha and corn silage. Those are actually specifically used for animal formulations, which we then can feed to cows. Those cows produce milk and then that milk is then turned into uh, butter and cheese that you then consume at the grocery aisle. So therefore we kind of see this whole entire view and end. And one of the things we try to do is continue to try to get better of uh, sustainably growing the right inputs as well as you know, making sure that we maintain that integrity throughout that supply chain. But today what we'll do is primarily focus on the Winfield United division of, of Land O'Lakes. So that's the group that I work with closely and, uh, and it's a distribution model. So I'm trying to advance the screen here. Oh, there we go. And, uh, and, and what I mean is we're a value added distributor. So we buy products from basic manufacturers like Monsanto, Syngenta, Bayer and BASF. Uh, and then we sell that to our retailers, which are part of our cooperative systems, and those retailers in turn uh, sell those products to farmers. So we work, we do work directly with farmers, but primarily through our retailers. And the two ways in which we try to add value into this, in, into our business, is through, is through applied research. And then we take the insights from those applied research and we use our ag technology platform to then um, be able to deliver those insights to those retailers and work with those farmers to help them make the right decision. So that's kind of a little bit of our, of our businesses set up. I'm gonna advance some slides here. And, and one of the things as we kind of get into this uh, and, and how we measure success in our business is really, you know, uh, there's two main crops we deal with. We deal with a variety of crops, but the two big ones are corn and soybeans. And on this chart, what you see is the average corn production in the United States. It's about 170 bushels per acre. So uh, an acre is about the size of a football field, maybe a little bit smaller than that. And a bushel is an eight gallon drum, as you can see in these little pictures. So the goal is to grow as many bushels, as many of these bushels into an, any given acre. So the average in the US is about 170 bushels per acre. However, the National Corn Growers Association does this contest where they let farmers take you know, anywhere between 10 to 20 acres and try to grow the biggest bushel they can. So how big of a crop can you get to? And, and really trying to see if, 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 if you care and feed the crops in the right way, uh, what is the potential, the upper limit? And what we see is, and over the last couple of years consistently, is the, the producers that have won this contest get up to 534 bushels per acre. So therefore there's this gap between the average of 170 and the top end of the potential of 534. And what we try to do, at least in our industry, is how, do we, how can we help farmers close the gap and be more uh, productive, right? So how can we get them from 170 bushels to 180 bushels to 190 bushels to 200 bushels? Because one of the things that's a limiting factor is we don't have that much more arable land. So we'll have to do more with what we have. And, you know, just by going from 170 bushels to 180 bushels, that's the equivalent of about 6 million virtual acres that are created uh, without having to use more land. So that's kind of our mission and what we try to do as, as, as an organization. Now, the way we do it, as I mentioned earlier, is through that applied research. And, and what I mean by that is we have about 200 uh, uh, research plots throughout the United States. And uh, you can see here, they, they, size any, they, they vary in size anywhere between 40 to 80 acres. And in that picture in the background, you see how we uh, organize these test plots. And what we do there is we uh, try the different seed varieties that are available in the market. We plant them in different conditions. We apply different crop protection applications. Uh, we, we, we try different plant nutrition treatments and we see how those, uh, that, that plant responds to everything else we're doing. So every year we capture over 6 million data points and we do about 750,000 uh, replicated trials. This gives us a lot of information about you know, how a crop performs in a specific region. We capture that data and then we make that data available to local agronomists, local retailers, as well as retailers across the country. So they can now are better informed and can work with farmers to make a better decision on how to maximize uh, their investments on their farm. And obviously, uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time in going to the details of the data we collect, but I did wanna give you a little bit of a flavor of what that means. So when I say we, we capture this data, uh, so for example, for corn, again, I go back to that because that's our staple crop. You know, There's probably four types of, main four types of, of uh, data we capture. You see them here in the list, response to population, response to nitrogen, response to rotation, and response to fungicide. So what we mean by that is a population is you put, you know, in a, in a higher yielding area, you put more seeds and see if it actually does better than the low yielding area. You put more nitrogen, 
nitrogen is a main ingredient to, for corn, and can you give it unlimited nitrogen or you limit the nitrogen, how does that plant respond? So what you can see here is what we've seen over the years. And uh, just for, for the sake of this presentation, I'll focus maybe just on the response to nitrogen. And you can see is when you, when, when you give a specific um, uh, crop or a specific plant unlimited nitrogen, it could have a 60 bushel advantage. That's the average over the number of years. If you focus on 2017 there, for example, it's 68.8. So on average, when you give corn unlimited nitrogen, it has almost a 70 bushel response. But what's more interesting than the average or the median is the variance. So you see that on the right-hand side. So some varieties respond 39 bushels or 40 bushels and others respond 97. So therefore, if you're a farmer and depending on the practices and how much nitrogen is available to you and what the commodity prices are doing, you might go for a, 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 a specific seed variety that has a 97 bushel response versus the one that has 40. But you know now that you have to apply that nitrogen, otherwise you're not making the most of your investment. So that kind of gives you an idea a little bit of some of the decisions and some of the insights we try to bring to these farmers. Now, the goal for our uh, ag technology platform is to really, the mission for us is to advance agriculture intelligently through technology. And you'll see that in a minute, how we try to make that happen. But in essence, the goal though, is to connect data science and math with the art of trusted local agronomy. What do I do by, what do I mean by that? Well, it really just, uh, agronomy is still a very local art. Um, you have to know the fields, you have to know which areas are high yielding, low yielding, you have to know the soil and how it performs over the year. So those farmers that have, you know, year over year farm those fields have a really good feel for that. And those agronomists that, you know, support those farmers in making decisions also have a good feel for those, for those fields and how they perform uh, over the years. However, you know, we're entering in this age of this mathematical age of agriculture. And really with the advances of big data and, and, and some of the computer science um, advancements, we're really able to now uh, analyze some of this information I just talked about a second ago, and through some really neat tools, bring this information into the hands of that agronomist and farmer so they can further uh, improve uh, the decision-making on those fields uh, year over year. So, you know, how do we do this? What are some of these tools? And I'll cover these a little bit into more detail, but really for us, it breaks up into three areas. We have what we call our in-season decision management tools. These are selecting the right variety for your field and then making sure that you can um, monitor the progress of that uh, crop throughout its life cycle. We have what we call our answer tech and data silo. And these are tools that help us first analyze what's in the market, what tools are out there, what, what are the things that could help a farmer, and then use a data management solution to connect different platforms together. And the third one is really we've been in the business of really building web portals to be able to deliver these insights both to that agronomist and the farmer so it's readily available on their tablets or their phones. And so that kind of gets into that digital engagement with the customer, making sure that the right information is at their fingertips. So kind of going into those in-season decision management tools, you can see here how they break out. So the first tool we use is something called the R7 tool, and we use a combination of satellite imagery. So satellite, we take a picture of a field on a good clear day, and then the light reflectance off that field will tell us how that field's performing, so as you can see in that little picture there, the blue area is a high yielding area. That means there's high biomass in that specific area. So the plant reflects well, and we assign that color to it. Whereas the area on the left maybe is not as high, uh, as higher biomass. So yes, we have this green or red color. That kind of gives us an indication of how that field performs. So with that in mind now, like the, below that, you see some of that information, those response to scores that I mentioned earlier. And so a combination of, look, this is a high yielding area for you. These are the types of uh, seed varieties that could do well on this. This is the conversation the agronomist and the farmer have in selecting the right seed variety for that field. Once they've done that, they can create a prescription right in the tool, take that prescription, put it in the tractor, and it'll plant it according to those specifications. Once the crop is into the ground, then we use you know, low and medium satellite resolution imagery to look at how the crop is performing over time. So red areas may be struggling, yellow areas may be okay, and the green areas are doing well. So now it gives the agronomist an, an idea to go and figure out where they should focus their attention. Then we use a tissue sampling tool that it's a little phone app and you go out there, you have a little plastic bag, you take a piece of the tissue sample from the corn, you put it in the bag, you scan the QR code, that's sent to the lab and it comes back with a report on your macro and micronutrients and helps that, farm, uh, that, that agronomist make the right recommendation to improve that field. And then finally, we have our newest tool, which is called the field forecasting tool. So now we're kind of getting into more machine learning and algorithms. And this is a, a crop model, so therefore we take the imagery, we take the tissue sample, and this deterministic model will then start to churn out to say, this is where your yield is trending right now, and here's what you might have left on the table 
that if you make some adjustments, you might be able to get a higher yield or the best choice might be just to leave it as it is. So, and I'll cover that a little bit later when we get through an example. So that kind of gives you an idea of a little bit about how these tools work. Um, so let's move on to the next screen. And so I just want to kind of give you an idea of that field forecasting tool I just mentioned a second ago. So on the left-hand side here, kind of just going um, clockwise, we have our answer plot data with those response to scores. We take into account uh, weather data uh, on a daily basis, but also kind of the monthly projections as well as what's happened in the past. We take that satellite imagery with a stack of them over the given part of the field. We take those tissue samples with the macro and micro reports. And then we also take a little bit of what was called as, as applied data. And this is uh, nutrients that have been applied to that field since the crop has been uh, planted into the ground. So now we have a good idea of how this crop is performing. And that little picture in the middle shows you, you know, the gray parts there are the areas where we've lost yield. And they maybe there's probably a reason for that. And then the picture in the bad that has that chart that looks like a heat map tells you this is a good time to apply this specific nutrient like nitrogen. Maybe this is a bad time. It's not financially worth for you. And we help make farmers make that decision. But then by bringing in um, the imagery into the whole picture, we can also see how the field lays out. And instead of being a satellite image like you saw earlier, now what we're doing is more, it's more of a crop model. And you can see the left-hand side of the field is doing quite well, whereas the middle part of the field is not doing so good. And it gives you the distribution of the yield. And to say, if you're going to focus your attention, it might be in two areas. Either one, protect the left and right because they does not have disease there and things are doing well. Or you go in the middle and if there's something that could be fixed now, at a reasonable cost, maybe that's the step you need to take. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of how we use this, but now we have to put this information now in the hands of those agronomists and, and, those, and those growers to make sure that they can make a, a decision pretty quickly. So we actually build the websites for our retailers, and through these websites, now we're able to deliver these agronomic insights. Uh, and some of these agronomic insights might look something like this. So we might could start with a disease map, and we're able to get these either from the basic manufacturers or there's some we develop ourselves, and by county, we can see that specific uh, environmental conditions will lead a specific pest or disease to infiltrate a specific area. So what you see here by the state in different counties, it says this county's turned yellow. And so therefore, there's a higher probability of disease there, whereas if it's dark green, there's a lower probability. Well, we take that information along with the information we capture in our research plots, those answer plots, and we get to see which varieties have a high response to fungicide. So there's some that have high response, which means they're highly susceptible, but if you apply the right protection product, they do really well, or they're, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't do well, and so therefore we at least have that, that information, and so it's not therefore worth spraying on those, on those specific crops. Now with the tools that we talked about earlier, we know which varieties have been planted where, so now we can focus on those counties that have a high susceptibility that also have those varieties planted into those fields. And then we take all that information and through the website, we're able to deliver these insights to those growers and farmers. But let me give you a quick example of how that happens. This is what a, a logged in experience of one of those websites looks like. So the first thing you'd see is maybe some of the quick kind of delivery of information saying, hey, certain fields are trending down based on the ones you're, you're managing today. There's an opportunity to boost the yields on certain fields. There may be some water deficiency detected in specific areas, or as we talked about earlier, as far as disease, there's those aphids detected in a specific region, and therefore you might want to take a look at that. We also bring in that satellite image, as I mentioned earlier, and what you can see here is we can, I'll focus specifically on the corn side. What this shows is, you know, this person has about uh, 27 corn fields, and there's nine that are trending up in biomass, 15 are trending average, and three are trending down. And then on the soybean side, three up, seven average, one down. And then at the bottom there, it shows you there's one field that has a deficiency in water, uh, two fields have a deficiency in nitrogen, and one field has a deficiency in potassium. And to specifically kind of narrow down that attention or for that agronomist and grower, we can see these are the four fields, the three corn and the one soybeans. And that field 47, as we saw in the notification earlier, has the most potential. That 165 represents the fact that there's an opportunity here to regain 165 bushels if you do the right things, because right now you're just at 138. So this field has high potential, but therefore right now it's not living up to its potential. And there's something we could do there about that. So that's kind of how that works, but at the same time, we also pop in articles from our agronomists, from our master agronomists that have PhDs and masters in this area, and they also write a lot of these articles to really educate our audience now about what happens if you apply uh, fungicide to a receptive hybrid or seed variety. What happens if you put plant nutrition as a top priority in season? What, what would happen then? So at least it starts to educate the growers about what are the things they could do to help with that, 
And then the right hand side, you can see that they can quickly contact those folks and have a conversation because all this things happen pretty fast. And so therefore you have to make these decisions pretty quickly. We've been at this now for about, we started our journey in 2010, but we really amped it up in the last three years. And one of the things we also do with, uh, with the power of the analytics we have is to see, you know, how are our customers doing? Is the technology actually helping them? But obviously the question goes, well, what about the farmer? Is he just spending more with that retailer and not getting benefit? Or is there, is there some benefit to that farmer? And that's the area I wanna focus on here in the last section of my talk is really how does it help a farmer? And I thought the best way to demonstrate that was really through an example. So this example is one from this past uh, growing season. We work with a specific farmer in Eastern Tennessee. And we usually always like these challenges when somebody comes to us and says, look, I have this field, it averages anywhere between 150 to 160 bushels. It's not a good field. I think it should be making more, but I'm not so sure what other changes I should be making to my recipe to get it to that next level. So what we do is we start working with this farmer and the first thing we do is take the tool, map his field. We identify, we look at the soil composition on that field and you can see every field has a different uh, soil composition. So you have to understand what that composition is so you know why there's a high yielding or low yielding areas. And we would look at the satellite imagery from previous years and you can, as you can see, the, actually the soil types sort of match how the field performs. So blue is really good. Uh, green is, is okay, and then, and then red is not so good. So we at least understand where the pockets of issues might be. From there, we can now then create a prescription for that farmer. We select the seed based on his preferences in farming practices, as well as what could work best in that field. From the middle of that picture, right to the left of the, of the field itself, you can see those response to scores that I mentioned earlier, fungicide, corn on corn, population, and nitrogen. And then we create a, a prescription, that's what's on the right-hand side, that pretty much matches how the yield uh, performs on that field. So the bluer areas, we have a different higher population of seed, the green areas not so much, and so therefore we create a, a little map that looks like this, put that in the tractor and then plant it. Once the crop is into the ground, the crop starts to come out, and as you can see here now, there's a, real, a red area there in the middle, uh, that means there's having some issues there, and then you see the agronomist there on the right hand top right, that's going out there, and the satellite imagery, you know, you can hardly see any crops on this field, However, the satellite imagery will even pick it up at even when it's that low. And in that middle area where the guy's standing is where that little spot is. And then the, tissue, the, the gentleman takes a tissue sample that goes back to the lab. And you can see that in some, some of the macronutrients and micronutrients are doing awesome and some are not. So therefore, as a result of that, now they can decide what applications they need to do in the middle of that field. The next piece to look at is the crop model. As I mentioned earlier, in this specific case, they use the crop model for looking at water availability in the tool. And uh, as you can see, the daily water status was okay for a while, but as the, the season went on, that obviously changed. And when we got right down to that July 14th date, there was a little bit of uh, the, the availability in the, in the soil of the water had issues, and so therefore this field's trending down. And now it's also alerting this farmer of when they should turn the irrigation system on. See, in the past, he'd have turned the irrigation system the minute he had two or three days of, of drought, but now you can see that the, so the water in the soil stayed all the way up to July 14th, so therefore, He's also conserving some water as a result of uh, using some of this technology. So where does this net up for the farmer? As you can see at the very top, you know, he used to yield 150 to 160 bushels. Now he's 195 bushels, which is 22% up higher compared to previous years. So he's pretty happy about this, but the best is to look at his economics. The total cost, right, of 36,000 has gone up compared to what he had done in the past of 34,000 because he made those uh, nutrient applications in season but his total income as a result of his higher bushels is now 66,000 versus 52,000. So he's doing pretty well from a gross margin perspective and he's happy. But yet the better story into all this though is if you calculate his input to output ratio, it's reduced from 65% to 54%. And what that really means is he's actually more sustainable. The inputs that he put onto that field went onto the plant. They didn't go out and leach out into the rest of uh, the, the soil and then back into the waterways, which would then cause pollution. So therefore, he's much more economical about how he's doing this, and he's actually much more profitable. And what's super about this is that now the farmer, the economics for that farmer is now driving sustainability. And when you do that, we have a win-win. And so this is what we try to do every day and how we try to use the data and some of the newer technologies that are available to provide you know, the right tools into the hands of our retailers that then can help the farmers make better decisions on their farms. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Teddy. Um, and if you have any questions for Teddy, be sure and send them in and we can address as many as we can towards the end of the hour. Um, 
I know, in, you know most of you probably are not in agriculture, so some of the, the details of that may not uh, have direct application, but if you think about many of the things that he was saying, they're common themes throughout many industries and throughout many organizations about increasing uh, customer engagement and doing it through data. Lots of tools that Teddy showed were, were exactly about that. And trying to quantify some of these things about, well, if you've increased the cost by this much, how much has it changed, uh, how much revenue is coming in? Uh, and convincing people that perhaps they can spend a little more and it will pay off for them. So. Um, Teddy and his group, you know, are exemplars, and I really like the story there. Um, and they represent some organizations, a subset of organizations, that are finding new and different ways to make data work for them. So David, in just a second, will talk about the details of our research program, but I wanted to first quickly expand from this specific example of Winfield and Land of Lakes uh, to what we see happening across a variety of organizations in this year's research program. And so our main findings this year are about the continued growth of competitive advantage from analytics. Uh, this is uh, a, a trend that's been going on and David will speak to that in a bit more detail. One of the ways that we think the, the mechanisms behind this is that analytics is driving customer engagement. And that that's, gives us some reason to think that uh, these, this advantage is, has some substance to it, um, and David will, get, will go into that again as well. Um, one of the things that came out in Teddy's presentation was also how many different sources of data that they're incorporating, and that's common among other analytically mature organizations. And one concern people might have is that by sharing this data, they, they might lose control, and we'll, we'll see in some of our coming results that sharing that data actually not, not only doesn't lose control, it actually helps improve influence. And so I wanted to go through those main points, but we got detail coming behind those. And, and to give some background on where these findings come from, uh, David Kieron, who's the executive editor for the MIT SMR Big Ideas Initiative, he's the perfect person to do that. So I'm gonna, uh, so David will give us a little more detail about how this is happening and some of the history behind it. Thank you, Sam. Um, sure enough. We are, we're, we're very excited about this new research, uh, which is the latest report. Uh, as you can see, in our eight-year-old content initiative, exploring management issues and opportunities connected with data and analytics. Uh, this initiative is part of a larger set of big idea initiatives conducted by MIT Sloan Management Review. Uh, and, and these examine how large-scale trends such as data and analytics, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and digitalization are really influencing the practice of management. Our report this year, as in years past, as, as you mentioned, Sam, is based on survey data and interviews with practitioners and thought leaders. For this report, we surveyed 1,900 executives in more than a dozen industries. That's about an average number of responses compared to surveys in previous years. We also conducted interviews with 17 executives. And normally I would leave it at that, but uh, since Sam is sitting in the next room, I should acknowledge that Sam did all of the interviews and his power of persuasion is one of the main reasons <laughs> Teddy is with us today. Uh, so thank you, Sam. Uh, this is a sixth report sponsored by SAS, and we're grateful for their financial support. And if you've yet to read the report or have yet to access it, the URL at the bottom of, this, uh, of most of the remaining slides will take you to the report. We'd love to hear what you think of it. All right. So as mentioned earlier, we've seen a rise in the percent of survey respondents who agree to a moderate or strong extent that their company's use of analytics helps them create a competitive advantage in their market. This trend follows a downward trend between 2013 and 2015. We believe there are several reasons for this new upward trajectory. One is that companies are getting better at using data and analytics to improve customer engagement. Teddy just spoke eloquently about his organization's use of data, which in turn has helped others use data more effectively. The overall data ecosystem for many companies has improved, from uh, data suppliers to proliferation of analytics tools to a more committed management focus on data as a core asset. More companies are taking advantage of this ecosystem to tailor their offerings and improve customer retention. But as we'll see later, many have yet to do so. Another factor is the emergence of platform companies 
like Amazon, Uber, and Airbnb, which are using analytics to displace incumbents in several industries. They're putting pressure on incumbents to raise their awareness of and capabilities around analytics. And Amazon uh, presents a great example. When Amazon was granted a pharmacy wholesaler license in a, in a dozen states last fall, incumbents in that space, companies like McKesson and Amerisource Bergen, the big multi-billion dollar companies, they experienced a sell-off in their stock. The news also influenced merger talks between CVS and Aetna. We spoke to an executive in a payer organization who described how new entrants were creating pressures on them to develop their analytics capabilities and take, take risks that they weren't really accustomed to taking. In the agriculture space, you have trusted partners helping usher you into the world of analytics. In the pharmaceutical space, competitors are forcing the action. Using analytics to optimize your systems and processes shouldn't be the end goal if your systems and processes can be rendered obsolete by innovative new models. The innovations that optimize aren't the only kind of innovations. Another reason behind the, uh, the rise in competitive advantage we see is managers' access to useful data. For the sixth year in a row, we've seen a strong majority of managers report an increase in their ability to access useful data compared to the previous year. That's shown in the orange column on the left. And this goes back, so we have data going back to 2012 on this. But turning more access to useful data into insights that can be used for strategic purposes is an issue. Less than half of respondents agree that they're somewhat or very effective at doing this. The gap between access to useful data and generating valuable insights is now at 28 percentage points. That's the difference between 77% uh, and 49%. Now, when we first started asking these survey questions in 2012, the gap was much smaller. Then 70% of respondents said they had more access to useful data compared to the previous year. But 56% said they were effective at using insights to guide strategy. That's a difference of just 14 percentage points. So between 2012 and 2017, in six years, the gap between increased access to useful data and the ability to use insights for strategy has doubled. And part of the reason for this, we think, is that as more parts of a company have access to useful data, in some cases for their first time, they need analytics talent to make sense of it. And if that talent is scarce, generating valuable insights can be troublesome especially if the insights aren't achieved in accordance with consistent standards. Strong data governance is really necessary to ensure that the data is used consistently to generate credible insights. And we talked to uh, one, uh, one person, and again, it was Sam, Sam talked to this, but uh, the, the, the content is, uh, is the same. A company's data is like a living environment that needs tending, pruning, Democratizing data without proper rules can wreak havoc. You don't want the proliferation of data in your organization to become like the proliferation of weeds. Uh, Sam, Sam and I, both advocates today have written on uh, the, like problems with the democratization of data. But companies that can bridge the gap between having access to useful data and generating high levels of business value from it are still a minority in the corporate landscape. We've been assessing analytics maturity in organizations for the past six years. The maturity categories that you see here, analytical innovators, practitioners, and the challenge groups, are based on responses to two survey questions. One is the extent to which a manager says their organization is using analytics to create competitive advantage, and the other is the extent to which their organization is using analytics to innovate. We group respondents who said uh, on both those questions, great extent, and put them in the analytical innovators category. Uh, just a little more detail on these groups. Analytical innovators tend to incorporate analytics widely across the enterprise into all levels of decision making. Practitioners, they tend largely to use analytics to track and support performance indicators. And challenged organizations, they display limited analytic cap capabilities. The thing to notice on this chart is that the innovators category has grown dramatically in the past two years. From 2012 to 2015, the numbers were relatively flat, between 10 and 
Then they jumped to 17 and 20% in 2016 and 2017, respectively. What's interesting also is that the growth of the innovators category has come primarily at the expense of the practitioners group. From 2012 to 2017, the practitioners group has shrunk by almost 25%, from 60% in 2012 to 46% in, in uh, 2017. So to, if we were to sum up the slide, there appears to be a widening gap between the analytical haves and have-nots. One of the things we discovered this year is that there's a strong correlation between analytical maturity and customer engagement. Analytical innovators are much more likely to be engaged with their customers than other analytical maturity levels. Indeed, they're twice as likely as challenged organizations to engage their customers. So this data shows just a correlation. So it could be that companies that are good at analytics are good at many things, including customer engagement. However, as Sam will discuss, and Teddy already has, there's a strong case to be made that part of what separates innovators from other organizations is their ability to use analytics to engage customers. That said, we did find an interesting data point that shows a surprising similarity between all the mat maturity groups. All of the maturity groups showed similar levels of risks of losing customers. Sam and I talked about this a fair bit, and there's a straightforward explanation for this finding. You might think that innovators should have a lower risk of losing customers relative to other maturity groups because they have stronger engagement with customers. But innovators may be able to discern the many ways their customers might be lost to competition just because of their strong analytics capabilities. So according to this interpretation, innovators' heightened awareness of customers and competitor behaviors leads to a greater appreciation of the risks of customer loss as a result of what they're able to do with analytics. Alternatively, one might expect that innovators would be at a higher risk of losing customers uh, if you focused on their ability to uh, tailor offerings and collect data on on customers, so uh, and some customers might see that as invasive in a way that uh, would make them run from that uh, uh, company. But our results show that innovators obtain business benefits with no worse risk of losing customers compared to other maturity groups. All right, thank you, David. So one of the things that we really got interested in this year was this idea that there are so many things that organizations must do correctly to get analytics correct. So what we've done this year is we've looked into, we've, we've studied these analytical challenge practitioners and innovators for several years now. Uh, but this year we actually broke it out uh, in a little more depth to look at the different activities that these different organizations are good at or, or better at than other organizations. And we broke them into three categories. First, we looked at how good they are at ingesting data, capturing, aggregating, and integrating data. Then we looked at how, how well they are at, at analyzing that data once they've got that data ingested. So this is the use of descriptive and predictive and prescriptive analytics. And then third, we, we looked at how they were able to apply those insights from the, from the data analysis. And so how they were able to get those data insights throughout their organizations and put them into automated processes. And from that, what we did was we developed a, an index based off the conglomeration of those questions and the details for how we did that aggregation are in the report. Uh, but what we found to start with is that organizations that are, are more likely to be analytical innovators are also rate high with this uh, analytics core index. And that gave us uh, some confidence that uh, these measures are, in fact, um, representative of something going on. When we look at this core index, what we looked at as well was, you know, if, you, if you're listening to, to what Teddy was saying, there are a lot of different data sources, uh, external to their organization and internal to their organization, that they're using uh, to, to in their analytical to build their dashboards, to build their their portal. Lots of other people are doing similar things, and so we asked people, you know, how many different sorts of data sources uh, are you incorporating, and when organizations are pulling in these these greater numbers of data sources uh, they need better abilities around ingesting data analyzing data and disseminating data to take advantage of that 
and that's reflected in the higher analytics core index. People who then are able to do those, uh, have a higher core index then, have a, are able to turn these greater number of data sources into better, for example, engagement with customers, which is the first line. And then we, have, we measured other uh, more detailed aspects of customer engagement, such as using feedback and customer intelligence, uh, whether customers are satisfied and how well they were able to tailor offerings. So in each case, uh, you can you can think of it as, you know, these are in fact, you know, correlations, but you can think of there being a relationship between the strength of their internal processes analytically internally and how many data sources that they're able to apply to this particular problem. Um, one of the concerns that people might have with with this data sharing and how many data how much data is going back and forth was that they might lose influence and so you know, we've seen people in organizations create silos and want to hoard data and it looks like that what we see is that in fact quite the opposite happens so the more customers uh, the more organizations are able to for example share data with customers uh, they're, they report that their influence with that customer group is, in, is increased. Uh, Teddy's example earlier shows exactly that. Uh, they're sharing a, a tremendous amount of data about their, their plots and their answer plots, and that translates to um, much greater influence with that customer group. It's not that the customers then get that data and then run away. Uh, no, they actually use that as a, uh, to engage more deeply with the company. Um, and we see that not only with customers and vendors, but also some interesting other parts like uh, competitors. So sharing data with competitors uh, seems to increase people's influence uh, with, with those competitors. Um, so some of the fears that perhaps uh, the, the data, the use of data, or the sharing of data might, uh, might give up some power uh, don't seem to be well-founded, certainly in the results that we've seen so far. We tied these, again, back to our core uh, analytics core index. And across the, across the board, when we see, if we ask people if they agree moderately or to a strong extent, or to a great extent, whether or not uh, they're able to engage with customers, people who are, in fact, engaging with customers um, do seem to have a stronger rating on, around all of our measures uh, along the core index. And if you look at the last one, and David alluded to this earlier, that the risk of losing customers does not seem to be commensurate. It's not that they feel uh, that they're invaded or that there's lots of, that they're giving up a lot of uh, control. Um, instead, uh, they're no worse off despite the fact that they're improving on every, every other metric here. David, I think that uh, you were gonna talk some about the B2B and B2C differences we saw. The, the, the cool thing about this slide uh, is that as you can see, on the left-hand column, which says B2B, uh, there, there is just, it's just a more substantial set of columns, uh, which shows that across maturity levels, uh, B2B companies uh, seem to uh, be getting more customer engagement uh, across the board than B2C or uh, 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 managers who say their companies are both. Um, Teddy gave a great example of sort of the benefits of using data and analytics with your uh, business customers, but his definitely isn't the, uh, the, an isolated case. We found many other examples that support this point. Uh, they're in the report. I encourage you to uh, take a look at the report and, and see if they're, they're across industries. Uh, we talk about a South African bank, uh, talk about Mall of America. Uh, there's some really interesting examples. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the importance and value of uh, real-time data, and uh, that uh, timely data encompasses so much more than just uh, real-time data. Um, what, we, what we see here is that having more timely data is positively correlated with various measures of customer engagement. Uh, more likely to engage with customers, it's associated with more likely to use customer feedback, more likely to have better customer intelligence, more likely to have tailored uh, to, uh, to tailored uh, to tailor specific offerings, and more likely to have satisfied customers, and uh, a slightly lower risk of losing customers. So while David is looking up some of the questions that he's going to, to, to bring from the audience here, uh, one of the focuses today has been on 
the things that are new that we found this year. And you know, one of the things that I think struck us particularly this year was how many things, you know, there's several things that aren't new. Uh, every year we do this research and we see similar sorts of recurring themes. Um, and we've identified five of them in the report, and I'm sure that there are more that you may have uh, out there. But people struggle to find the balance between data and human partnerships. You know, what is the role of data? What is the role of humans? Uh, it's, it's not that uh, one beats the other, and we keep seeing the combination that uh, using both is better. But finding that balance is difficult for people. And although we talk about leadership and culture, um, it's you know that's not a very data focused or analytics focused uh, attributes but these are very important uh, the, the role of leadership in in establishing an analytics culture and these are the the softer sorts of skills that that don't translate into the details of models but again are are places that organizations continue to struggle um, organizations also seem to have uh, you know, lots of decisions about how they organize. Are they centralized, decentralized, centers of excellence? Um, lots of options that organizations have, and uh, people are struggling to to get this right and to as they as they mature. We again see lots of things about uh, how important it is to exactly what what you measure. So whatever the organization measures ends up being uh, what 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 people respond to, and that's not a surprise. We've seen that for years. Um, and, but the important thing that, uh, that keeps coming out is the, getting those metrics right make a, make a big difference. And finally, you know, we, we talk about how all these things that people can do with data, but having quality data is, is obviously the precursor to all this. And this will, um, this is something that keeps coming up. All the, the, the you know, nice slides that Teddy showed earlier uh, they're built off data that someone, I'm sure, struggles mightily to to get right, and so that's uh, that uh, that data quality ends up being, particularly as David mentioned, with the increases of data year over year that we keep seeing, keeping that quality high is um, is an enduring problem. So I'm hoping that at this point, David has some has found some questions and um, as is ready to go with them, David. Thanks, Sam. I, I have, and uh, not surprisingly, there are a lot of questions for Teddy. Um, uh, <laughs> and not for, so uh, why, don't, uh, why, don't, why don't we start there, uh, and uh, we've got about 10 minutes. So, uh, Teddy, one question is, how important is real-time data for, uh, uh, for say, general loss in uh, if, if, if there's an identification of that there's sort of a loss in nutrition in the in the field, if the nutrition comes late, isn't there a risk that there will be overnutrition? And so the timeliness of data really uh, really seems to be important in uh, addressing a, a number of uh, uh, crop maintenance kinds of issues. Uh, good question. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, uh, the timing is, is very critical. And if you think about it, uh, what makes it challenging is the uh, in the United States, you know, average average farm um, has about a thousand acres. A thousand acres relates to about you know anywhere between 15 to 20 fields. So as a farmer, when you manage those fields, you know, where do you pay attention? You, I mean, you can look at all 15, but it's very difficult to to put your time. So what? Well, first of all, what you need to know is, okay, which of my 15 should I, you know, put most focus on? And then on that one specific field, now we're taking anywhere between, you know, 30 acres to 100 acres. And that's, that's a, big, uh, a big chunk of land. And, and so which area is having an issue? Is it, is it is if it's a disease that is spreading? If it's in nutrition? Is it, if it's malnutrition? Is it predominant throughout the field? Uh, do I just need to care for one specific area or the whole area? So the data, uh, knowing exactly where to go and how much and when, becomes very, very critical, especially in that May, June timeframe, which is when, uh, when the crop needs the most, the most attention. Uh, so timely, timeliness is, is key. And you know, that's one of the things where we use satellite image to help us narrow our focus. Uh, we use the crop model to help us at least identify where the areas that have the biggest gaps. Um, so real time, not in the sense that you know, it's happening right now and two minutes later, I need to know, but real time within a couple of days of things happening, I need to know where to put my attention. But just as I explained the, the vast number of issues that could happen there, you know, real time for us, two or three days is, 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 a, very, is a very tiny window. So 
but getting that right makes the, the difference in the world. Great. And uh, another another question that came up uh, directed towards you relates to your use of this platform in developing countries and whether or not you have any partnerships with uh, uh, Monsanto or, or Bayer uh, to deploy this like outside the U.S. Yep. So that's one of the pieces I didn't mention earlier. Uh, Land O'Lakes, there's also Land O'Lakes uh, International Division. And that, that group is solely focused on um, international work and, and really helping uh, smallholder farmers, whether, whether it's in South America, Africa, or Southeast Asia. And what we try to do is a lot of what we've learned here in the United States, whether it's through that uh, answer plot work on how to set up those trial farms and, 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 and learning more from that, or whether it's the technology itself, we do try to take that uh, internationally in, 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 in Malawi or Rwanda or Ethiopia. And um, we do have a division in South Africa that's, that's part of our you know, re regular business. And that kind of really becomes uh, the launching point for uh, adapting our technology and our tool sets uh, to that to the region and then expanding from there. So uh, we're doing quite a bit. We want to do more. Uh, we, we see quite a bit of partnerships with USAID and the, um, uh, and, and the Gates Foundation. So um, that work is always ongoing and, and we try to amp it up more and more every year. Okay, so uh, th thanks for that. The uh, there are many many possible follow-ups, but we want to make sure that uh, Sam has an opportunity to uh, 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 get a chance to answer one of these. Uh, and uh, I'm happy one listening that... to Teddy. He's pretty interesting to me, so <laughs> don't, don't don't feel the need to. But he's pretty he's pretty fast. Well. Well, uh, I'll, you know what? I'll present this next question as an opportunity for either one of you uh, to, to <laughs> okay. tackle. Um, uh, but uh, this has to do with uh, there seems to be, uh, and and this is this is in the report as well that uh, many of these examples of using analytics uh, to deepen customer engagement is actually moving organizations from. Uh, transactional relationships with customers, especially in the B2B uh, realm, to uh, deeper, uh, more engaged kinds of relationships. So what is, what is this signal about the potential of data to uh, transform customer engagement? Well, I mean, one of the things that we did, and it, it gets a little bit lost when we focus on the charts and slides, is just how many people we talk to um, about this that have corroborating stories. Um, actually, as, as we're sitting here, you're saying that, I was thinking about Lenovo and the example that they gave of how, because they're somewhat insulated from their customers, this data stream that's coming directly from their customers now is giving them insights to how their customers are behaving that previously they had a, a kind of the retailer step uh, in between them. And so they were able to uh, to use this data to, to really understand what was going on through that more direct connection. All right. Uh, yeah, it was it's it it was really uh, uh, I guess it's not surprising, but it was very telling to see example after example after example where companies were using this uh, uh, arid, dry information uh, uh, to to actually have much deeper kinds of engagements, or even different kinds of uh, levels of uh, customer intelligence uh, based on the data, and, and leapfrog no, and the, intermediaries. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and the one thing, this is this is Teddy, the one thing I'll add for us is, you know, in our business, it's very easy to be, uh, to have a relationship that's very transactional. Um, and when that relationship becomes transactional, the discussion becomes about price. So what's the best price you can give me? Now, when we start to use data and technology into that conversation and bringing insights into that discussion, then that it turns into more of a value-based discussion of, you know, what, what, what value am I getting out of this? The, the information has really helped me make a better decision. And so then, I mean, price is still important. I mean, I have to run my business, but it becomes less of the prominent issue and it was more about return on investment and the right decisions I need to make. So that's also one of the reasons why we're really trying to shift more into this space. David, you mentioned something about um, the platform aspect of that, and I think Mall of America is a good example where they then become a provider of data to their retailers, um, and it, it's allowing sort of an economies of scale approach to data that 
uh, other places haven't uh, been able to do, and Swiss Re mentioned that as well, that they can they can then become as an additional service this this data providing. There, uh, we have one last question, uh, and that uh, connects with, uh, it seems that with B2B influence being greater, um, uh, what is this, uh, what are the implications of uh, uh, greater, if, uh, if, how does that impact the supply chain? Um, Well, actually, I'm not sure. I can, maybe I can jump in there. I think Lenovo gave an example of that, that, uh, that it lets them connect much better. Um, but it, there, you know, the, almost every example that we have here was about places where people were able to figure out things about their customers um, in, in ways that affected their ability to, you know, if you think about what, what does that information do, it helps them prepare better, it helps them have stock available, it helps them have access, and I'll come back to the Mall of America, they can tell their retail stores how many people to employ, uh, how many people to have if it's going to rain. Uh, if it's raining or snowing, then they can have, that can inform staffing and get better customer experiences. And so there's a whole chain of people that that has to go through then. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's it for the questions. Really appreciate everybody's uh, participation. I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Allison. Uh, who's going to wrap things up? Thanks, David. I just wanted to let everyone know, as David mentioned, it was the that was all of the time we had for today's Q and A. But over the next few days, do be on the lookout for a feedback survey that's coming your way via email. We really appreciate your thoughts and opinions on the program today. And I'd like to remind you as well that a recording of this program and the slides will be available within three to four business days. So take the lookout for that email as well. Lastly, if you would like to continue this stimulating conversation, we will be hosting a chat on Twitter on March 1st, um, that's another Thursday, two weeks from today, at 11 a.m. Eastern time, where we'll be discussing more concepts and key findings from our report with these co-authors, David and Sam. You can join that by heading over to the MIT SMR Twitter page at that time, or following the hashtag MIT SMR chat. So that will conclude our program today. Thank you for attending, and thank you again to our presenters, Teddy Bakelli, Sam Ransbotham, and David Kieran, and also to our sponsor, SAS.